Um, I have been doing this a long time. I started in 1989 working with manure, much to the dismay of my parents who had spent a lot of money sending me to school and thought working with manure maybe didn't justify their investment. Um, I'll tell you, when I didn't start in Indiana with Purdue, I started somewhere else that has a good football team. <clears throat> and um, the first uh, introduction I got to the the industry, the fertilizer industry, by my department head, um, one of the uh, fertilizer dealers said, I am sick and tired of blank, 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 bringing in people here to ruin our business. <clears throat> and my department head asked me to leave the room, you know, and he, they had a, a discussion. So uh, at the time, every time I talked to a farmer, he, they would say, uh, I hear these uh, manures, the nutrients aren't available in those manures, are they? And I need to add just as much nitrogen and phosphorus as I would whether as fertilizer as if I didn't use manure. And all the micronutrients aren't available either. And that was the common perception throughout the farmers that I was working with. And so we've come a long way since then now acknowledging the fact that those nutrients are actually available in manure, that we can actually utilize those nutrients uh, as a benefit to crop production, and that there are uh, issues related to those nutrients because they do build up to, to high levels when we're utilizing manure. The other thing I noticed when I looked at the research that had been done, uh, mostly in the 70s and early 80s, a lot of it was targeted to how much can we put on a single piece of land and not reduce yield or kill the crop. So there was the disposal attitude uh, in the 70s and just looking for the, a limited amount of land so we didn't have to haul manure, et cetera. Again, things have changed quite a bit. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, in general, about manure, manure management in the beginning and then specifically about nitrogen. I don't mean to isolate nitrogen separate from phosphorus and potassium and all the other issues. Uh, you had plenty of talks today, and, and really, you have to take a, a coordinated, holistic approach to managing, managing manure. Uh, my presentation will be on my website by the end of the week, and it's soilfertility.info. Um, if you want to pull this up and, and look at it at a later date, since we don't have handouts. Um, manure is an economical source of nutrients, especially when soils test low in P and K. And we heard today uh, with our talks that oftentimes we get an accumulation of P and K because we're going to try to primarily use the manure as a nitrogen source. Once those soil test levels get built up to a certain high level where you take many years to deplete those nutrients, we're trying to use that manure as a nitrogen source. So we want to use it as efficiently as possible because really the only short-term value we're going to get from the manure is from the nitrogen component. And no matter what we say, utilizing this manure and recycling those nutrients to crops is, is the best use. We don't have any alternatives that are, can be widespreadly uh, adopted uh, widespread. Well, why is it difficult to use manure? Um, even our, our highest nutrient concentration, the, the poultry litter, poultry manure, is a fairly dilute source of nutrients. You're talking about on, on a as-is basis, typically less than 5% NP and K, and in the liquid manures, substantially lower than that. We heard earlier about sampling. Manure composition can vary quite a bit by the age of the animal, the, the diet, the handling system, the season, you know, control of water. I think one of the biggest improvements that I've seen in almost 30 years now is, is the utilization of water and the efficiency of water use in the rearing facilities and having manure that's drier, therefore, 
a higher concentration. And also from a nitrogen standpoint, the drier the manure can be kept, the less water that's introduced, uh, the more aerobic that manure is, the more nitrogen is actually retained in the manure and can be transferred to the fields. Um, manures are complete nutrient sources. The micronutrients are available, you know, phosphorus, potassium, and of course nitrogen's available too, but when they're used for, uh, based on their nitrogen content, you over apply most every other plant nutrient. Retaining more of that nitrogen in the manure through handling helps with that because it concentrates the nitrogen, reduces the losses from the facility, and uh, makes it a better balanced fertilizer. And then I think one of the things that's really overlooked a lot is how difficult it is to be uniform with the manure. We're going to have to make decisions on whether we need more nitrogen or whether we have enough. And it's not that important when you, for phosphorus and potassium when you have way more than you need in every part of the field. But when you're trying to manage nitrogen closely to provide what is necessary, then non-uniformity becomes an issue because you have areas of the field that don't have enough and other areas that have too much. So just a few uh, steps here, kind of review. We need a good sample. We need to know the nutrient content. And we have to have a reasonable assessment of how uh, available those nutrients are. And again, that's most difficult with nitrogen. Um, we need good soil sample and a requirement of the crop to be grown. Uh, speaker earlier talked about crop removal of, of phosphorus, uh, particularly when soil test phosphorus is high. Uh, those levels of nutrients in the grain are, are fairly consistent and have stayed fairly similar over the last 30 years. That's one of our, our best estimates uh, in, in doing our nutrient uh, Manure and nutrient calculations is what's actually removed from the field. Um, uh, we, of course, we want to be, uh, well, I, uniformly, we talked about that at the correct rate. Um, one of the students asked me about calibrating manure spreaders. Did we ever do that? Sure, you know, we put out tarps and, and pans and caught the manure in the field in our research and, and most of the growers that I worked with, um, you know, of course with liquid it's not as hard, but with uh, solid manures, poultry manures, you need to know how much uh, you have in, in your spreader and, and kind of adjust it to put out the right amount for uh, uh, based on the nutrient analysis and the desired application rate. Um, we need to reduce or supplement with other nutrients as well. And primarily we're going to be supplementing with nitrogen and eliminating the uh, commercial applications of P and K and micronutrients. And then uh, there's a big advantage to incorporating nutrients. And I know this is a conservation tillage uh, conference, but uh, injecting into the soil and some incorporation has always been one way to reduce nutrient loss and the odor and fly issue that come along with some, some manures. And then um, above and beyond that, there's other conservation practices that help filter that water as it leaves the field and help to reduce some of the nutrient impacts uh, of those nutrients. So let's, let's talk specifically about nitrogen. Uh, in Indiana, the thing I see that really most affects nitrogen availability, and it's probably similar here, is application, application timing. So we have facilities that don't have much storage, and you see manure being applied to fields that will grow corn in May with applications occurring in August in September, in October, in November, in December, in January, and February. 
So the timing is not ideal to optimize nitrogen use, and you'll see that a lot of our manures are really not much different than commercial fertilizers in the forms and availability of nitrogen in those manures. Uh, if we're going to put manure on the soil surface, there's a component of most manures that's in the ammonia, ammonium, or urea-like form, and it's subject to ammonia volatilization. So anytime we leave a manure on the soil surface, we have the opportunity to lose some of that nitrogen to the air. Uh, there's a component that's organic. That's going to be available over time. And the availability is dependent on temperature, moisture, soil type, incorporation, and, and all of those factors. And so that's something that we um, have to estimate, uh, and it varies from year to year. And I just state the obvious, availability is, is difficult to predict. So uh, we're doing a lot of uh, estimating and guessing and assuming in uh, determining nitrogen availability. So composition affects that availability, timing, placement, and rate, uh, soil properties, weather, temperature, and rainfall, uh, the interaction of all of the above. And, and recently there's a lot of interest in uh, putting manure and cover crops out together and allowing the cover crops to take up some of that nitrogen and then trying to predict how much of it and when is it going to become available. And all that really is still in the, in the research phase because uh, that even, even more complicates uh, the estimates of nitrogen availability. All right, so manure analysis, I think most laboratories nowadays uh, estimate both uh, ammonia or ammonium nitrogen and organic nitrogen. Uh, most manures, unless you do composting, poultry litters, uh, most of the time nitrate is inconsequential or absent from the manure. So we're basically dealing with what's uh, reported as ammonia or ammonium nitrogen and organic nitrogen. There's also some urea and urea-like compounds that are in manures, and they're generally represented um, in the, the organic nitrogen fraction. And they would be more available, their availability would be more like ammonia or ammonium. So here we have a, a poultry litter. Um, and the total nutrient content here in these two columns is reported on a wet weight or an as-applied basis. And you see here we have the total nitrogen, which is broken out into ammonia, nitrogen, and organic nitrogen. They actually measured nitrate nitrogen, and you see it's a very small value, so they didn't even calculate how many pounds per ton um, nitrate were in this particular poultry uh, manure. Uh, it reminded me of when in 1989 we started a uh, manure analysis program at the university I was at at the time. And um, I, I produced a report something like this. And this old crusty professor said to me, have you ever taken a manure sample? And I said, I've taken a few. Uh, he said, have you ever spread manure? I said, I've, I've spread some. He said, do you really need to report the nitrogen content of the manure to two decimal places, given the variability in manure sampling and manure and the spreading ability of the people that you're going to be working with? And I said, I guess not. <laughs> So don't get too, too into the numbers here. You know, we don't need to, to carry it to two or three decimal places. Basically, there's about 40-something pounds of organic nitrogen per ton in this manure and about 13 pounds of ammonia or ammonium nitrogen. Uh, the solid manures are going to be more organic nitrogen and less ammonium nitrogen in this 1 to 3 or, or even a 1 to 4 ratio would be pretty common in poultry manures, 
depending on the, how the manure is handled. So it's important to, to recognize that total N and available N are not the same thing. Uh, there's a fraction of that organic N that even when we would incubate it in the laboratory under ideal conditions, you can never find. So it's in some compound that's not going to release um, you know, over the course of a year or year and a half. Uh, maybe it comes out eventually, but when we looked at it in these uh, laboratory experiments, we never found, we never found it. Um, so how much of that organic N does come out and, and when does it come out are important in determining the availability. And then these really inorganic compounds, ammonia, ammonium and urea. Um, ammonium can be taken up as, by the plant. All three of those compounds are gonna change to nitrate, nitrogen. And really, we're just worried about how much of that stuff we lose. Um, if we can capture it all in the soil and keep it from going out in the tile or up in the atmosphere, it's basically 100% available. It's just how much of it gets lost between when we put it out and when the crop can utilize it. Um, we use a pretty uh, intricate estimate of nitrogen availability. I'm not quite sure what's officially used in Ohio. Um, but I think this approach is, is reasonable and, and something similar to it would, would be advisable. So it considers the, the type of manure, uh, liquid, solid, and whether it's irrigated. Uh, it's based on ammonium and organic nitrogen measurements, so not some, some labs may just now report total N, but in order to use this availability, you need to know both forms, and then how it's placed in the soil, whether it's injected, incorporated, or left on the soil surface. And then we break Indiana into uh, northern and southern and, month, and look at month of the year. So temperature and rainfall is going to have a big influence on availability, uh, particularly the further out from planting the manure is applied. And I'll just show you this chart. We're, we're not going to really uh, uh, look at it in detail, but just show you here. I think the battery is, is going in this thing, too. It's kind of weakening as we talk. Uh, so here we have a surface applied, not incorporated, liquid manure, and we're looking at the ammonium nitrogen and how much of it is remains available. So this number represents 30% of that nitrogen becoming available to a crop planted the next spring. So if we're talking about ammonium, we're not talking about it not becoming available to the plant. We're talking about it being lost before the plant can utilize it. And then when we get up into the, uh, the winter applications, the estimate is maybe 95% available, so not a whole lot of, of loss. Uh, Brad Jorn is responsible for these numbers. They're based on research and, and research in the literature, and uh, um, they're, they're reasonable estimates. Uh, the organic nitrogen doesn't change much depending on when it's applied, and in the organic N from the non-poultry manure, so your dairy, horse, swine, uh, is fairly low. It's only 30 to 35 percent, and the poultry organic N is as high as 60 percent. So this is a, just a plot of the availability over time. Again, um, we have a lot of li particularly liquid manure that goes out after wheat in August and September, and you see the availability of the ammonium nitrogen is pretty low. Um, for incorporated manure, it's about uh, 45 percent. Um, and for uh, surface applied, it's uh, down around 30 percent. So mo most of the nitrogen loss is, occurs because it's just out so far from planting that the ammonium converts to nitrate, and then that nitrate can be lost in the tile or go up in the atmosphere 
through denitrification. Uh, the surface application loses a little additional nitrogen just for the fact that it's sitting on the soil surface. Uh, it has a high pH. It drives off some of the ammonia uh, before a rainfall occurs. Uh, that ammonia loss is highly dependent on how soon it rains after application. If you get a rain within the first few days, then a lot of that ammonia nitrogen will be captured in the soil. Uh, most of the loss occurs over the first five to seven days, so anything beyond that uh, doesn't really matter because most of the nitrogen has been lost uh, during that first several days. So if you were going to incorporate manure to capture nitrogen, you need to do it shortly after application as possible because otherwise that ammonia is already been lost to the atmosphere. Uh, when those materials are put out later in the year in, with cold temperatures, both the conversion of ammonium to nitrate and its subsequent loss and the ammonium loss to the atmosphere are reduced by the cold temperatures. And so that later application, if you don't have snow melt or rain on frozen ground, uh, can capture more nitrogen um, than earlier applications. Dr. Baker mentioned the very important environmental loss of the phosphorus and suggested they weren't agronomically very important. So we weren't losing a whole lot of phosphorus from the fertilizer application, even though that little loss has a big impact on the environment. With nitrogen, you have a big impact on the environment and the losses are agronomically significant. I'll show you an example later which looks like we lost 250 pounds of nitrogen applied in a dairy manure. Uh, commonly, you're going to easily lose 30 pounds, uh, 50 pounds or more of the nitrogen that's applied uh, in the manure, depending on when it's applied and the weather, et cetera. But the, the losses are substantial, both agronomically and environmentally. Uh, organic N availability doesn't change a whole lot with uh, the season or the, the application month. So it's typically pretty small, 60% uh, or so for poultry and half that for non-poultry organic N. So here's our, our poultry litter sample with about a third of the nitrogen in the ammonium form. And we're going to put it out in August after wheat. And we're only going to capture about 20% of the ammonium nitrogen and about half of the organic nitrogen. So our plant available nitrogen content is only about 26 pounds of uh, plant available nitrogen per ton. That's an estimate. It can be higher than that. It can be considerably lower than that, depending on ha what happens between August and May. If we put it out in February in preparation for planting, soils are cold. Uh, we get some rainfall to move the ammonia in. We're going to capture most of the ammonium and about the same amount of organic in. And, and we've increased our plant available nitrogen by about 50%. So this timing is very important in capturing as much nitrogen as possible. And the closer that application can be put out to the planting of the crop, the better off you are. Uh, a dairy lagoon liquid. Um, the liquid manures are going to be equal or more ammonium than organic in. And so the surface application has the potential to lose a larger percentage of the total nitrogen that's in the manure. Here with surface application, instead of uh, having about 17 pounds of nit available nitrogen uh, or total nitrogen, we're going to reduce plant available nitrogen to only a third of the total and only have about five pounds per thousand gallons. It should not be tons, it should be thousand gallons. And then if we can wait till February, we double that plant available nitrogen. So again, timing is the most important component. 
So that's just an estimate of availability dependent on all those factors we talked about, and a lot dependent on the weather. Uh, the availability can vary from season to season. So uh, we worked with a, a farmer that periodically uses uh, dairy manure in his operation. So I think uh, every other year, or every third year, he uh, contracts with a neighbor farmer to put about 14,000 gallons of dairy manure, dependent on the weather, sometime in October and November. Most of it he shoots to get on in early November if the weather is cooperates and the soils are not too wet. Um, each time they, he takes a sample, uh, typically it has about 250 pounds of nitrogen per acre, and the, with an estimated availability based on those calculations I showed you earlier of about 130 pounds of nit available nitrogen per acre. We had done a number of trials uh, with him on his non-manured land, and we found that he needs about 200 pounds of nitrogen, commercial fertilizer nitrogen, uh, side dress to maximize yield. So we're putting out 130. We would expect that he's going to need more in the spring of the year because he's going to lose some of the nitrogen from the manure and some of it organic fraction wouldn't be available. So <clears throat> beginning in 2010, he said he, he learned enough about his non-manured ground. He wanted to do these uh, field trials with his manured ground and look at nitrogen response. So in the, in the first year, um, we put out different rates of fertilizer, starter only, about 35 pounds of nitrogen up to about 150 pounds of nitrogen, so 35 starter and about 115 side dressed. We looked at this response and compared it to the previous uh, four years that we did trials on his non-manured ground, and it was no different. Uh, we never reached maximum yield, and we estimated that it may have been like his other his other trials, and we probably needed 200 pounds or, or so nitrogen to maximize yield. Basically, he got no nitrogen value out of that manure that he put out in the first week in November. All the nitrogen was presumably lost. It could have been locked up in the manure, but that's not likely. So in 2011, we, we uh, expanded our end rates. We weren't high enough in 2010. We, we shifted the curve upwards. And the results were totally different. Basically, it looks like he got tremendous value out of the manure. Uh, he almost maximized yield with starter only. Uh, surely by this 100-pound uh, mark or so, somewhere between there and there, he... Uh, maximized his yield, and it looked like maybe the estimate of availability wasn't too bad. Oh, 2000, we did it in 2012. It averaged 48 bushels, probably not representative. we did not going to show it. 2013, another pretty flat response curve with a lot of value from that manure put out in the fall of the year. 2014, 235 bushels with that fall application. Doesn't really look like he lost a lot of manure nitrogen. So now we figure we're doing it again in 2015. Uh, 2010 was an anomaly. Uh, he is getting a lot of value, except up uh, 2015. A uh, very strong response to fertilizer nitrogen, very similar to the non-manured ground. <clears throat> and it doesn't look like he got much value out of the fall applied then. Now, you think you could look at the weather data and make sense of this. These are different fields. He's moving, moving this around the farm. Uh, we have manure analysis for every year. 
There's nothing that I can look at. Rainfall, he has a, a Coco Ross site. He actually measures rainfall and temperature every day um, and reports it on the Internet. But really, no rhyme or reason to these real strong responses where the manure had no nitrogen value and these real flat responses where the manure had more value than you would predict. So what can you do? I think, you know, manure analysis and calibration and estimates of availability, those are good starting points. But I don't think we're going to figure out how to optimally use manure without making measurements during the season. And the one that we've typically relied on has been the pre dress soil nitrate test um, to measure what's in the soil early in the season, uh, and then making adjustments beyond that. Now, there's sensors and there's computer models and uh, aerial imagery and satellite imagery. Those things are coming on, and they are going to be most useful in manured fields. But really, there's not a lot of data yet to support uh, their use. Uh, so a PSNT would be sampling the upper one foot or sometimes two foot of soil just prior to side dress time. The longer you wait, the more accurate assessment of availability. Um, and uh, takes a lot of cores. Soil nitrogen is very variable, particularly when manure is used as the nitrogen source. Um, and uh, those cores need to be mixed thoroughly and a subsample taken. Um, samples for nitrate and ammonium ought to be sent to the laboratory immediately or uh, kept cold because the nitrogen will increase dramatically as the soil sits in a warm, moist soil bag. So you want to handle those samples um, appropriately and get them to the lab right away and keep them cold. Uh, as cold as possible. Um, most people measure nitrate. Sometimes we measure ammonium. Um, ammonium is a predominant source in the manure. You're counting on it being transformed to nitrate, but if it's been cold or wet, that nitrogen is going to stay in the ammonium form. So sometimes I like to measure the ammonium as well as nitrate. Um, the, this test is really going to be best with manure or maybe a perennial legume. It's not particularly useful if you don't have those nitrogen sources in the, the cropping system. So if you just have corn and soybeans that have been fertilized, unless, unless you have a 2012 where maybe a lot carries over, it's not too helpful to take samples and I, I wouldn't waste my time in, in those situations. But with manure or uh, a cover crop that's got a, a lot of legume or an old alfalfa field, PSNT can be useful. The test, uh, there's really two components of it. It's very good at telling you when no more nitrogen is needed, and it, that's a critical level of 20 parts, 25 parts per million nit nit nitrate nitrogen. There's a lot of data to support that as a cutoff. If you're above that, uh, you're unlikely to get a response to nitrogen. Uh, and that's illustrated here. Um, uh, when research that was done throughout the Eastern Corn Belt showed that about 67% of the time um, levels were above 25 parts per million and they indicated that no more nitrogen fertilizer, nitrogen was needed. Um, but it did make a mistake quite often, about a third of the time, and it, the test was below 25 parts per million, which said nitrogen was needed, but in, tr in reality, it actually wasn't. So you have a, a false positive. You don't need any fertilizer, but it would recommend fertilizer. Uh, only 1% of the time did it make the expensive error and say there was enough nitrogen in the soil but actually more was needed. So uh, that's where you get a reduction in grain yield.
So it's good as a switch. It's really not great for telling you how much you need when you're below that 25 parts per million. And this is the old chart that, that we've used for many years. And you'll notice the yield, corn yield potential only goes up to 180 bushels. And that doesn't really matter because nobody makes recommendations based on yield anymore because they found that there's no good relationship between how much nitrogen you have to add and, and the yield achieved. And so in Indiana and here in Ohio, we have the, the MRTN approach where we have research uh, recommendations based on research results. So Northeast Indiana uh, with $3.50 corn and $240 UAN, we'd suggest you need about 220 pounds of nitrogen to maximize profit. And if you want to use the PSNT results to adjust that, this is what they come out to based on previous research. So we've just taken that old chart, taken out the yield potential part of it, and looked at the, the changes in recommendations. So if you're below 10 part per million nitrate nitrogen, we'd suggest the full rate between 11 and 15, uh, reduction in 30 pounds per acre, 16 to 20, reduction of 45, 21 to 25 part per million recommendation of 90 less than 220, so 130, and then above 25, no side dress N. So if you've used the old PSNT recommendations, they're the same in Ohio, and you want to take out the yield potential component these are the adjustments that would be made. The other thing that we found to, to be useful, not of course not to make adjustments during the growing season, but to get a feel for the availability coefficients and the, the program in general, how well it's taking advantage of the nitrogen is this end of season corn stalk nitrate test where you begin about six inches above the soil surface and take an eight inch segment out of the stalk. Uh, initially, uh, the research had been done to show, uh, to take samples two to three weeks after black layer. And then uh, people that were raising silage were interested in going earlier and Penn State did a lot of research that showed that the results were the same, whether you were a quarter milk line, which is a couple weeks before black layer, up to three weeks after black layer. So they expanded this sampling zone uh, to go earlier in the year, which uh, is great for silage. It's also more pleasant, I think, to be out there at that time taking samples and you don't have to worry about the combine um, eating you up either. So. Um, the test is misinterpreted a lot. It's really useful for identifying adequate to excessive N, but it's not very helpful to tell you if you're deficient in nitrogen, and I'll show you why. Um, <clears throat> we have a, a pretty recent update on this, and then uh, Purdue has, Sylvie Brudere has a, another publication that's very helpful if you want to do corn stalk nitrate testing. Uh, I'm going to show you some data that we got from our uh, strip trials and on-farm tests um, in assessing the end-of-season corn stalk nitrate test. All right, just uh, a little bit on, on why it works. Uh, on the top here, we have a, a nitrogen trial, and we reported the grain yield in bushels per acre. We had uh, something about 35 pounds of nitrogen, about 90, uh, all the way up to a little over 250. And the yield went up sharply from 35 to 100 and topped out somewhere here between 100 and, and 130. So we've maximized yield. Um, and then we measured corn stalk nitrate associated with that yield. And you see here these first two points before we reach maximum yield, have almost no nitrate in the stalk. So the plant is deficient in nitrogen, 
and it removes all that nitrate from the stalk, uses it to make protein. That protein uh, is uh, um, transferred to the grain to, to make yield. Once you at attain maximum yield, the plant still takes up nitrogen and it stores it in the, in the stalk tissue. So you see that the levels begin to accumulate in the stalk and they just continue to go up as we added more nitrogen, but didn't, didn't influence yield. So looking at this stock nitrate level um, is a good indicator of when uh, adequate, you know, maximum yield has been attained and then the higher levels are associated with excessive availabilities of nitrogen. Um, so this is a, a bunch of data, and there's a lot of different symbols and colors that just represents experiments. I think there was about 50 experiments that we used to develop this, this uh, relationship. And you see here is relative yield as a percentage of predicted maximum yield. So we did a nitrogen response curve for yield for each experiment, and we took each individual plot and we looked at the relative yield of that plot and the stock nitrate associated with plants taken from that plot. And remember earlier I said it's not good at telling you that the corn is deficient. Uh, so here at low levels below 250 parts per million, yield goes from anywhere from 20% to over 100%. So there are plants that reach maximum yield that have utilized every bit of nitrogen that's in their stock tissue. And then there's plants that are terribly deficient that only made a fifth of maximum yield, and they've used everything that's in that stock tissue as well. So there's really no information to be gained here at the low levels. But once it begins to accumulate in the stock uh, above 250 parts per million, you're more and more likely to be at maximum yield. You see here almost every value is above 80% of maximum yield. Here it's above 90, and once we get above 4,000 parts per million, all of those are clustered around 100% of maximum yield. So th these levels are pretty sensitive, and I'll show you in a slide or two. Um, once that nitrogen goes above the optimum, the plant accumulates uh, nitrate pretty rapidly. So we found from analyzing our data that once you get above 4,000 parts per million, you're more than 30 or 40 pounds per acre above what's necessary. So it's definitely uh, an excessive level. When you get below that, then you're talking about 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 pounds per acre above uh, the optimum. And that's yearly variability. Uh, you can easily have 30 or 40 pounds too less one year and 30 or 40 pounds uh, too much the next year and be doing a good job. But I, I'd say uh, once you get above 4,000 parts per million, your, um, your nitrogen program is, is providing too much nitrogen and you ought to consider uh, making modifications. Uh, this uh, just illustrates the excess, and you see at these bu uh, above 4,000, 4, you're starting to get 50 and 100 and 150 pounds too much nitrogen uh, provided to those plants. Um, and we do see levels up around 15 and 15,000 parts per million, which is one and a half percent which is higher than the concentration of nitrogen at the gra in grain at the end of the season. So the plant will continue to accumulate that nitrogen uh, to pretty excessive levels. Um, just to illustrate here, above 4,000, uh, you're getting into areas where it's obviously too much nitrogen. Um, summary, nitrogen availability is very difficult to predict. Even with fertilizer, it is infinitely more difficult when animal manure because there are so many factors that affect that availability. Um, availability coefficients are 
just that, just estimates, and the true variability varies from year to year. So I don't believe there's any way to accurately predict uh, nitrogen availability, and you have to do something to check on that availability. <clears throat> uh, the earlier the manures uh, uh, put out, the more uncertain the availability, so trying to move manure applications into in-season, as I heard you had a talk this morning about side dressing with manure, or shortly before the season really helps in estimating that availability. But even so, you really do need some methods for testing availability. And the, the most uh, tested that we have is the PSNT you know, measuring soil nitrate early in the, se in the cropping season. Uh, I think the end of season corn stalk sampling is helpful in assessing the manure application program and people ought to consider doing that every year on a, on a few fields to get a feel for where they are in, uh, uh, in, in the uh, nitrogen program, if they're excessive or whether they're it kind of in the ballpark with their application. <laughs>